Morning, church. My name is Janet, and I'll be reading the teaching test today. Uh, it's coming from Acts 6, from verse 1 up to verse 7. Uh, the topic of the text is seven chosen to save. Okay. In those days, as the disciples were increasing in number, there arose a complaint by the Hellenist, Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. The twelve summoned the whole company of disciples and said, it will not be right for us to give up the preaching of the word of God and wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole company. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicano, Timon, Permanus, and Nicholas, a covenant of the Antioch. They had, the, they had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread the disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, uh, everyone, again. Murundeni said this, we are starting a new series, and it's called Acts Season 2. I'm really excited about picking up the story of Acts, uh, where we left it off last year. Now, let me show you uh, three slides just to help us to get back on track with the story. You know uh, what it's like if you start a new season in a series, they say previously on and then whatever the story's name is. So this is important for us to remember. I am going to get on stage and I'm going to show you a couple of things. So firstly, Acts is about what Jesus continued to do and teach. The gospel account of Luke was what Jesus began to do and teach. It's one great volume, Luke and Acts, and this is obviously a picture of Luke. These were taken from the Bible project. They've got a map or a poster for every single book in the Bible. I didn't do this. It's great. You can go and get it at thebibleproject.com. Next one, please, uh, Rudolf. Then, this is a summary of what Luke and Acts is all about. How God's kingdom came on earth as in heaven, through Jesus and His Spirit and the church. So the message of the kingdom coming is the message through both of these volumes. And then these are the three things that we have to look out continuously for, or look out for continuously, when it comes to the book of Acts. So examples of faithfulness to King Jesus includes, amongst others, sharing the good news in word and action. You'll see that through the whole book. Forming diverse communities where people are equals, the best part of the book probably, and trusting in the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit. If you miss this, you miss the whole book. So this is the themes that we'll be looking out for in this next season as well. And then the last slide, please, Rudolf. So I know this one is busy. There's a lot of detail here. What I want you to see is we are still in Jerusalem because we picked up the story in chapter 6. What I want you to see is that chapters 3 to 5 spell out what they call a tale of two temples. And the point that Luke is trying to make is that the new temple, temple of Jesus' community is now where the people encounter God's uh, uh, healing presence and also His generosity. So this people called the church in Jerusalem is becoming a place where people are experiencing God's presence. Okay? And obviously, from Jerusalem, the message will go out because the Spirit was poured out on everyone. That word up there is Pentecost. So because God poured out His Holy Spirit on everyone, the witness started and this beautiful picture of the church started to emerge. And then where we are picking up the story is a section called the First Persecution. 
And then we have these seven verses that we read today right in there. So this is where we are starting season two. Now, today is Pentecost Sunday, which is a time in which the church across the globe celebrate the outpouring of God's Spirit and what that means. So we decided that this is a really good day to begin Act Season 2 because we're picking up a story of God's Spirit being poured out on His people, furthering His mission, doing what Jesus began to do, seeing His kingdom come, and sharing the good news with other people. We also decided that we won't be spending uh, a lot of time on only the topic of the Holy Spirit because in our previous series, or two series ago, I Am Who I Am, we spent six Sundays talking about the Holy Spirit. Okay, so our teaching text today is practical, very, very practical, and it is not that heavy. Next week, we will take a look at a really hard portion of Scripture. Every week we'll have our scripture as part of our design, which is also important for me to show you. Rudolf, if I can just uh, have the next slide, please. Uh, if when we communicate to you, oh, oh, sorry, I forgot this one, Ta, this is our YouTube channel. Thank you to Lesicho, who keeps it nice and tidy. Here's what I want you to see. If you missed out on the previous season, there we go. It's in a playlist. It's really easy. You click play all, and it cues it. So, 10 sermons. We had in season one, and we will have nine sermons in season two. Next slide, please, Rudolf. Uh, our design should portion in for every single week from now going forward for season two. Okay, so next week is a huge portion of Scripture, and the reason why I'm saying that to you is that you can read uh, ahead to prepare yourself also for the service if you so wish to do. So today is practical and not that heavy. Next week is really heavy. That's the Christian life now, isn't it? Think about it. Daily bread and our relationships in the family, dying for your faith. All of it included in the Christian faith because all of you were called to faith in Jesus and to give your life as a living sacrifice. Quoting Conke right there. I am going to do a call to service at the end of this sermon. And I'm saying that to you at the beginning of this sermon, because I want you to be open to it. In light of Pentecost, God's Spirit being poured out on everyone, it is a given that all of us will experience the power and the guidance of God's Spirit. And experiencing the power and guidance of God's Spirit leads us to serve, to give, and to sacrifice. Jesus didn't die and Jesus didn't rise from the dead so that we could just continue on our normal path of life. Think about it, guys. This is really important. Jesus died so that we could love. We were dead in our trespasses. We were dead in our sin. We were headed for the grave. But because Jesus died and rose again, He rose us to life. He gave us a new life. He gave us a new humanity. He gave us new purposes. He gave us new tasks. And He made us part of a new family. That's what Jesus did. And that's part of the story up until this point. So we can't hear the story and not respond to it. And I'm saying that to you in the beginning of the service. So that you would be open to feeling the Spirit encouraging you to uh, sign up for service. Okay. In this teaching text, we have a picture of the church trying to solve a problem. Great, great case study. The problem is really clear from the text. It's in verse 1. It says... Uh, as they were increasing in number, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. The church is growing. The church has challenges. Maybe the easiest illustration would be to think of a human being growing. I know all of us are not parents who has kids, but I mean, you are a human being. As you grow, you have different needs. As you grow, you have to adapt. Everything has to adapt. Your clothes, your diet, your priorities. And in the church, it's exactly the same. And growing doesn't come without pain. Do you guys remember growing pains? I, I was always short. I mean, I'm still short. But I remember in grade three one day, I said to my dad after a cross-country race, Dad, I've got this pain behind my knee. And my dad said to me, Dude, I think it might be growing pains. And I went, Yes! Come on! I'm growing at long last. I will enjoy this pain because it means that I'm getting taller. Well, I mean, it didn't last that long. But point is, growing comes with pain. 
So the church is growing really fast and they have internal strains. And there's lessons for us as a church to learn here. Why? Because Fellowship City has also grown. And since October, I believe, or we believe as your elders, that we have grown significantly. Which means that this text is actually really, really relevant to us. Let me show you our map. I'll do a, pray, a prayer and then we'll jump right in. Here's our map for today. Four points, long-ish points. And because I had to squash everything into four points, one of the points is three sub-points. Classic. Hashtag the life of a teacher. Guys, I always have more info than I can actually give to you in a palatable or attainable way. We should celebrate gospel-centered church growth. That's really important. Uh, second thing, we should expect problems when the church grows. Now, I know some of you might feel really discouraged and go, Jeez, Reina, just keep it positive. Guys, it's in the scriptures. We should expect these problems. Three, when the church grows, we must, here's the sub points, A, protect biblical priorities, B, make wise adjustments, and C, share the ministry in the spirit of love. And fourth point, we should see growth problems as opportunities for more gospel-centered growth. Okay, so it's four longish points, but I promise that it'll be meaningful and relevant to us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we open up the scriptures now, we pray that you would speak to us as the head of the church. We just heard that we are busy continuing to do what you started to do and teach. We are thankful for the fact that you brought us into this family, that you've made us new, that you've gave us new purposes and tasks, and that we can further uh, your kingdom in this world by being your church. I pray that we would be open to what it is that you would have us learn today. We pray that in your name. Amen. First point, we should celebrate gospel-centered growth. Have a look in the teaching text that verse 1 and 7 mentions numbers. The book of Acts makes the point that people counted other people. We count people because people count. Simple illustration. If you have kids, you're not going to leave if you have more or less all of your kids. You will count them because they are important to you and you need to make sure that all of them are there. As a church, it's the same. We need to know Who's part of our community? And that's why numbers actually matter. Rudolf, if we can have the first picture of all the domino pieces, please. And then you can leave it up, and then I'll ask you to go back to the teaching text if we need to. Luke makes the point that when the gospel is preached, the church is growing. Why? Because the church consists of people. And the gospel is preached to people. Now, I'm not saying at this church that we will play the numbers game. But I am saying that we, as the leadership of the church, and us as a church as a whole, should be interested in the amount of people we reach and in the amount of people that are part of the church. We have ten statements in the book of Acts that mention numbers. Okay? I wanted to put them up on a slide, but I thought they might make you a little bit dizzy. In 241, we hear of 3,000. In 247, we hear day by day people were being added. In Acts 4 verse 4, we hear that the number of men sat at 5,000. In 514, we hear more than ever men and women were added to the church. In 931, we have a mention that the church multiplied and became more. In 1349... We heard that the word of the Lord spread throughout the whole region and from everywhere people came. In 16.5, we read, it increased in numbers daily. In 19.20, we heard that it grew. In 21.20, how many thousands there are among the Jews that believed. Numbers matter because people matter. And when these kind of numbers start happening, people are complaining. Why? Because things are changing. Now, these numbers don't necessarily just bring complaints and challenges. We should celebrate these numbers because in the book of Acts, at least, people who were hostile to the faith are coming to faith in the thousands. And we should celebrate that and we should embrace this. Think of the South African context. In South Africa, because we are a, a freedom of religion country, and because we are historically known as a Christian country, 
many people in South Africa know about the church. Many people grew up in settings where you were taught the Bible, even though your parents said yes or no, or even if you wanted it. So in South Africa, we have a segment of people who chose not to believe, either because they've never heard the gospel or because they are very hostile to the gospel. These were hostile people to the gospel coming to faith. And I feel like there's, there's something that resonates with me if we think of the book of Acts and we think of South Africa. If we see new people coming to faith in South Africa, it will probably, in a city like Pretoria, be people that were previously hostile to the faith. And we should celebrate that, okay? We shouldn't try and keep it small because we don't want challenges and problems. We should go for big and then gladly receive or face the challenges and problems that come with it. Can I just ask, as a side, that you will continue to pray for this? In this area that we live in, we have about 12,500 people. That's a lot more people than uh, the people that are sitting in front of me. We do not have enough churches in this area for all 12,500 people, period. And all 12,500 people in this area and beyond does not sit in a church this morning. We need to know this. We need to pray for this. We need to go for this. We need to go to reach people in their numbers. Are you guys feeling me? Like we have to feel that urgency in this area. Sometimes I feel like I need to just close my eyes when I drive, which I can't do, because every single person that I look at while I'm driving, they're like, I wonder if someone loves that person, if someone has shared the good news with that person, and if that person actually knows that Fellowship City exists. Every time I run, it's exactly the same. So wherever I have the opportunity and I bump into a conversation with people, I ask them firstly, well, I say what my name is, and then I ask them what their, name, uh, what their names are. And then I say to them, I would like to know, do you believe in Jesus? Are you part of a church? And then whatever they say, I still pitch Fellowship City. And like the reason why I'm asking is I'm new in the area and I'm pastoring a church called Fellowship City. Have you ever seen our sign? We're in South Street, blah, 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 blah. Like every opportunity I have, I try and share this because we should celebrate gospel-centered church growth. It's in the book and therefore we should celebrate it. That was the first point. Second point. We should expect problems when the church grows. I know that doesn't sound really positive, but it's very true. If you can put on the next slide for us, please, Rudolf. I can't remember what the picture was. That's why I'm asking. Ah, there we go. Ooh, beautiful. Little metaphor of metamorphose, metamorphosis, growing from one thing to the next. We should expect problems. Why? So Jesus told two very interesting parables, amongst others, in Matthew chapter 13. In verses 24 to 30, it's the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And in chapter 13, verses 47 to 50, it's the parable of the net. And in both parables, Jesus speaks about gathering people and not knowing who's good and pure and who's not but saying that at a certain point in time, he will do the work of showing who's the wheat and who's the weeds, who's the good fish and who's the bad fish, preparing his disciples that whoever you have, whenever you have them, you will always have problems. Why? Because we are human beings, and not all growth is pure growth. I've been in ministry long enough to know that. Sometimes you might have a lot of people wanting in on what it is that you do, but not everyone's intentions are pure. So if you don't have pure intentions or pure hearts or mature believers, you've got problems. And we should expect that from Jesus' parables. Just think of the book of Acts. Simple example, Acts chapter 5, we have the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Like they were known in the church because they had money. And then they lied about the money and then they both died. That was a hard scripture. I can't remember who taught that one, but it wasn't me. <laughs> it's a hard scripture to read because they were such great people. And they tried to do the right thing. And then Peter said, you lied to me, therefore you will die. In Acts, we see in many of the regions that Paul eventually reaches, there's doctrinal confusion. Acts chapter 18 is a good example of that. Think of the New Testament, guys. The New Testament consists of letters that was written by Paul and Peter, amongst others, to congregations to do what? 
to say, hey, I miss you and I have a new puppy. No, to say, guys, you've got it wrong. Let me sort out your thinking here. The way you believe, the way you speak, the way you teach has gone wayward. We have to fix it. So even in the book of Acts, we see that there's this confusion. In Acts chapter 19, Paul is in Ephesus, showdown. Black magic on the one side, people causing a riot on the other side, the town governor <clears throat> sorry, trying to make peace, a blacksmith in the area accusing them that they're ruining their business. There's a whole lot of stuff going on. I mean, the book of Ephesians is phenomenal, but that doesn't mean that things were perfect in Ephesus. So idealizing the church in the book of Acts is a really bad idea. Because it is a model church, absolutely, but it's not a perfect church. The church in Acts had wins. The church in Acts had fails. And this is a fail. Why? Because they have to take care of orphans and widows, but they don't. They are neglecting them. And widows are a really important group of people in the Bible. I mean, you can't really improve on the church in Acts, can you? They've got the best leaders. They are actually writing the Bible. They receive their authority not from a university and degrees, from Jesus himself, but they still fail. And for us, that should give us grace for our church and for any church. Not saying that you were ever hurt by the church uh, is a bad emotion to experience, but we should have grace that the church can fail. Now, the second point is we should expect problems when the church grows. Now, the church has a variety of skills. The church has a variety of gifts. The church has a variety of personalities. And this should make sense to us, right? That all of us can't do everything, and that all of us will have to do something. Does that make sense? Because we're all different, and we're all given specific gifts. So all of us can't do everything, but all of us have to do something in the church. Which brings us, which brings us back to the problem. This is a real big problem they are having. It's spelt out in, in verse 1 as Hellenistic Jews against Hebraic Jews. But it's an issue of justice. Because everyone is not having or getting what they should. Because that's the picture of justice. Everyone has what they need. It's also an issue of culture, guys. Hebrew-speaking people, Greek-speaking people. It's also an issue of race. Because they were from different races. So what we see is this little fight in the family between these two groups of people. And now the question is, who is going to sort this out? That's the problem. It's only one sentence in our Bible, but it is a weighty problem. Let me take a quick segue here and just talk about this specific problem and other problems that the apostles had to face in the early church, because those are also problems that we will keep on having. The first one is the unity of the church. Because this thing is tearing at the unity or, or, or eating at the unity of the church. There's enough evidence of animosity between these two groups of people when they were all still Jewish. Right? So in the book of Acts we read that when you had Jewish believers that were pure Jewish and Jewish believers, Greek-speaking believers, they didn't even worship in the same place. So there's enough animosity already there while they were still Jews. Now they come to faith and they become part of the same family. And now there's distance between them because there is suspicion between them. And that makes sense to you as well. If you start getting suspicious of someone, you start distancing yourself from them. And that's exactly what happened in the church. So what does the apostles do? Or what do the apostles do? They muscle up, they call a meeting, and they talk about it. Kudos to them, right? Difficult conversation. Really awkward. Tough conversations. But they will not have disunity in the church. Secondly, they have to try to keep up with everyone's needs. At this point in the book of Acts, there's almost 20,000 people in the church. Guys, think about it. 20,000 people being led by 12 men. It was much easier in the early days to make sure that everyone has everything they need. And now they have to sort out all of these needs for this really big group of people. They've got no spreadsheets, guys. I mean, can you imagine? No Google Maps. No spreadsheets, no EFTs, no WhatsApps, no credit cards, no supermarkets, nothing. And they've got this huge need to sort out. They are being overburdened. It's part of the problem. 
They have an overburdened leadership. This group of people that can't do everything. And they are really honest in verse 2. The twelve summoned the whole company. It would not be right for us to give up preaching the word of God to wait on tables. We can't do everything, guys. That's what they say. Part of the problem is how to handle criticism. Can you imagine them praying for these seven guys and sending them out to do the work and then getting pushed back from the community, from people who said, listen, Peter, I really enjoyed it when you used to visit me and now Nicanor is pitching at my door and I don't actually know who he is. You know, Nicanor doesn't know me. Like, you know me. You know the kids. You know, uh, you know the story of my life and where I come from and we had such good times. There was definitely some pushback from the community as well because of this new group of people. They had to handle that criticism. Another part of this problem is they have to keep their ministry priorities in order. It's really, really easy in the beginning, but it gets more complex as the church grows because there are more to do and there's more needs that arise. I mean, listen, and I could keep you busy for hours about how easy it was to lead Fellowship City when we were two city groups. That's all we did. Two city groups got together for group, loved everyone. And that's it. Once we launched from the 24th of October last year, woo, it has grown exponentially. And it's going to keep on growing. We even have shared notes on the notes app on iOS. Short term and medium term goals. And on both of those notes, there are top priorities, bold and underlined priorities. And we'll get to it if we can priorities. Because that's just the way that a church works. So there's more to do, which means we have to be able to prioritize. Sharing the ministry is part of the problem. Who's going to help? And what are they going to do? And this is probably uh, uh, one last really important characteristic of this problem. Remember, I took a segue. We're still in the second point, okay? Is how to advance the mission while managing people. Because that's what leaders are supposed to do. And we need both. We can't just be all about mission and forget about people, and we can't be all about the people and forget about the mission. We need both of them in balance. We can't give up the mission to deal with management, but that's the challenge that they have at the moment. So, as the church grows, it's really practical, we should expect these problems and we can learn from the apostles that we should have conversations about problems, that we should prioritize well, that we should share the ministry, and that we should always keep the mission and the management both at the same time. Third point, when the church grows, we must protect biblical priorities, make wise adjustments, and share the ministry in the spirit of love. So, to talk about priorities in this context, is a, it's kind of a big deal. Because widows and feeding people are really important tasks of the church. Okay, so it's not like hustling the chairs or unlocking the building is what the apostles are saying no to. They are saying no to a really important job that the church is supposed to do. But they can't do it. Why? Because there's biblical priorities to what they are supposed to do. And they simply answered with, we can't stop doing what we were assigned to do. Why? Because if we don't preach, we don't have a church. We have a feeding scheme. Do you guys see that? That's really important. In a country like South Africa, the feeding scheme warms the hearts. But we can't just be a feeding scheme. We have to preach the word. We have to use the sacraments. We have to preach the gospel and see people come to faith. Otherwise, we are just a feeding scheme. And that's where the apostles are set in this portion of scripture. We can't stop doing what we were assigned to do. First things first. And our first things first is preaching the gospel. And guys, listen. This is now the apostle speaking. It's not like we only do it once a week. We read in Acts chapter 5 that they preached the whole day. That's why I told you that I'm preaching my sixth sermon in seven days. Because I'm really tired. These guys did it every single day. So they were committed to work. They weren't lazy. But they kept biblical priorities in focus. Second sub point was making wise adjustments. So this is the apostles as leaders saying we will deal with this, but we are not going to do it. Why? Because the church is an organism and an organization. An organism is something that always grows. An organization is something that has to be managed. The church is both. 
and the church in Acts were entering a season in which they needed some more organization because this organism was growing like a machine. They appointed seven guys, but not seven guys who seemed up for the task. Seven guys who were filled with wisdom, filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because they have a big job. I just said the church is 20,000 big. Twelve guys are giving the job to seven new guys. It's not like they can do everything. They will also have to prioritize and go exactly through the same leadership practice as the apostles. They need to delegate. They need to create teams. And that's the adjustment that the apostles are going for. A wise adjustment. And then I also said the third one is to share the ministry in a spirit of love. Share ministry, not share a task. Do you guys see that? They didn't call this a random thing to do. They called this a ministry task. They were looking for guys that were full of faith and the Holy Spirit. They prayed for them in the end. They blessed them. They sent them out to go and do it. Look in... Uh, um, Verse 6, they had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Important task. The only thing we know about these guys, I mean, we know Stephen is, we'll read more about him next week. We know Philip is, we'll read more about him in Acts chapter 8. We know that both of them are Jewish because they've got Jewish names. And the rest of the guys, the only thing we know is that they were Greek speaking because they have Greek names. So they were probably appointed to handle the Greek-speaking widows. A team that is chosen to do it best. It wasn't random. It was really, really intentional. Some have word gifts. Some have deed gifts. It's exactly the same in our church as well. Let me quote Peter from his own epistle really quickly. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 to 11, here's what Peter says. Just as each one has received the gift, Use it to serve others as good stewards of the varied grace of God. If anyone speaks, let it be as one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, let it be from the strength God provides, so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. This is why we are called to use our gifts, so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. And we can do both as a church. We can preach the gospel and we can care for the needs of people. But it's all about the church signing up and doing what everyone was called to do. Last point, and I'll end with this. We should see growth problems as opportunities for more gospel-centered growth. I don't know if you pick up, picked up the weird word in verse 7, priests. Look at verse 7 again. Priests. Hmm, who are they? I'm going to get back to that now. There are evangelistic consequences of the, apostles, uh, of the apostles dealing with these challenges well. Do you guys see it? Verse 7 says, The word spread, and the disciples increased, and a large group of really hostile people became obedient through the way they cared for widows. It's not a random task. It has evangelistic consequences. That's why they have to do it well, prioritize it well, make wise adjustments and share it with the right people. That's why the church had to get together and the apostles had to say, guys, we're not doing this. You need to step up and you need to do it. And it says that the whole company thought that that was a very good idea. I love that. Beautiful verse. It seems like a rhythm through the book of Acts. Preach, pray, grow, challenges. Face the challenges. Preach, pray, grow. More challenges. Face the challenges. And that's the rhythm through the book. Why? Because something really profound happens in these moments. Firstly, doctrine gets clarified. Whenever the church faces a challenge, it gives the opportunity for them to just, just dust off what it is that they believe. To just polish again their basic understanding of the Christian faith. To just remind each other again of why it is that we are here. And every church that goes through those challenges has that same feeling. When something like this happens, the church gets strengthened. This uh, seven verse portion is the springboard to the whole uh, next section of this book. 
It's almost like cultivating a garden. Now I know not all of us have green fingers. I know not all of us love a tidy house. But just imagine for a second that feeling of something was really out of order and dirty, but it's clean now and it looks phenomenal. A garden, you know, raking some leaves, pulling out some weeds, scuffle, scuffle. I actually don't know what scuffle is in English. Scuffle, scuffle. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I just made that up. But like turning over the soil and breaking the soil and giving it some water and pruning and harvesting and making sure that everything can grow. That's what happens to the church when the church faces problems. Now back to the priest. Priests. In Acts chapter 4, they were the ones who persecuted the, uh, the apostles. Do you guys remember that? They were the people who wanted to kill the apostles. And now we see in chapter 6 that many of them have become believers. Why? Let me put it to you. What they saw was so compelling that they could not not believe anymore. They knew all about preaching and caring because they were priests. That's what they had to do in the, uh, in the temple. But what they saw here was undeniable and mind-blowing. Think about it. The way they cared for widows brought a hostile group of people who wanted to kill them to faith because of the way that they did it. I wonder, uh, who did they become in the church? I wonder what happened to them and what did they do, this group of priests? I think if you look at the life of Paul, you might imagine that they also became teachers in households and in different settings because Paul knew the Bible really well and these guys did too. And Paul just uh, uh, you know, got into teaching really, really quickly because he understood the whole Old Testament. Just think of that, guys. If we would see in this building people that were previously really hostile to the church, teaching the Word, believing the Word, unbelievable or believable by God's Spirit. It's for us to decide. But that's what we should trust for. Let me end it off here. I would like you to consider taking up a call to service, every single one of us. And I would like you to consider that that's the real difference between calling Fellowship City your home and only coming here to listen, sermon, to listen to sermons. Because if you're part of this family, this is where you serve. If you only come here to listen to sermons, this isn't your family. This is just the place that you come here to listen to sermons. And we have grown to a place now where we cannot deal with everything that's on our table anymore. We just do not have the capacity to do everything that this church needs. But we do have the people. We do have the people to do everything that this church needs. And it's up to you to say, yep, I'm on it. Let's do it. Now, I won't be giving you a spotlight on each and every ministry we have. But I would like you to consider that the Spirit might be calling you into a season of service and a season of putting up your hand so that we can get through our current challenges, so that we can see the numbers increase, so that we can see the mission being furthered, so that we can see our priorities being kept intact, so that we can see more and more people hostile to the gospel coming to faith. That's what we want to see at this church. So let's celebrate gospel-centered church growth. Let's expect problems when we grow, let's deal with it, and let's preach, pray, grow, and face problems again. Let's protect our biblical priorities. Let's make wise adjustments. And let's share ministry in the spirit of love. And let's see our growth problems as opportunities for more church, for more gospel-centered growth. Let's take some time. Let's reflect on God's word. Let's reflect on the early church and their challenges. And then I'll do a prayer for us. Lord Jesus, we are thankful for the growth that you've given us. We are thankful for new people being added to your family. We are thankful that we had the opportunity to baptize people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit as a church, even though we are so young. We are thankful, Lord Jesus, for challenges that come with people, because the more people we have, the more people we have that uh, can hear the good news, can receive the good news and that can be saved, and that can be used in your body. I pray that you would help us as a church body, and for us as leaders, that we would keep our priorities intact, that we would be able to make wise adjustments, 
and that we would see more and more ministry shared. I can't imagine, Lord Jesus, how pleasing it must have been to your eyes to see your church in Jerusalem care for widows well and to see more and more people come to faith because they did that. Through discernment, through keeping their priorities and through being wise. We want to see that in Centurion. We want to see that undeniable, mind-blowing witness from our church in this area. We want to see people look at us as your church and say, it cannot be that Jesus is still dead because these people are living as if he is alive and he changed everything in their lives. I pray that we would take up this call, both personally and corporately, that as a church we will be willing to lay it all down for you, that we would get stuck in and that we would help to see your mission furthered in this area. I pray for a love and for a unity amongst us. I pray that we would not have distance because we are suspicious of one another, but that we would move closer and closer to one another because it's you, Lord Jesus, that broke down these walls of hostility and that put us back into the same family. I pray that you would stir our hearts for generosity so that we would give if we have. I pray that you would stir our hearts for trust that if we don't have, that we will receive from you because you are a good God that takes care of us. May your name be glorified, Lord Jesus, as we use our gifts and as we give ourselves to this mission. I pray that in your name. Amen.